A very good evening to all the students, teachers, and parents of SSVM, and welcome to the eighth episode of SSVM Edit Talk. So I'm Srisha, and uh, this is a very close to heart session for me um, as I interview Vanessa Liborde, uh, who I have personally worked with since my undergraduation in Canada. And this session is also close to my heart because um, of my passion for sustainability and keeping our planet clean and green. Thank you so much for joining us in this episode, Vanessa. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to connect with SSVM again. It is indeed uh, you know, quite lovely of you to do this session in the wee hours of the morning. <laughs> and um, thank you for participating in spite of the time difference as well between India and uh, Canada. Um, Vanessa, you are very much part of our SSVM family since mm. Planet Protector Academy was introduced uh, to our amazing um, students. So Ian, Sean, and um, Sarah, and your entire team has done a great uh, job doing uh, great initiatives with our teachers and students and we really look forward to seeing you all again at SSVM. So for our dear parents who are not aware of Vanessa and Planet Protector Academy, um, I'll share a few words about her. So Vanessa Liborde is from Vancouver, Canada and she is an Ashoka Fellow and the creator of the Planet Protector Academy, an award-winning interactive digital program that trains young students to be change agents for the environment. So Vanessa is an award-winning writer, uh, director, producer, composer, <laughs> singer, and an experienced designer. So her fun and engaging uh, programs have reached um, over a million programs, uh, children in all over uh, 150 cities across Canada, um, in the US, and also in India now. So she is a very creative systems thinker who seeks to find holistic solutions that work for um, all beings and for the earth. So Vanessa is the founder and um, executive producer of the Canadian charity Dream Writers Productions, which distributes the Planet Protector Academy internationally. So Vanessa was also nominated as um, YMCA Women of the Year. So she she's an all-rounder and has achieved so many things uh, and has mm -hmm. passion towards the environment. And it's such an honor uh, to have you here with us today, Vanessa. Thank you. It's an honor to speak with you also. So beginning with the session today, um, are we really friends of the earth? Each of us must become leaders in our homes and um, in our schools to foster the development of a new mindset surrounding how we interact uh, with our earth. So we must also learn to recognize our interconnectedness and empower ourselves to respect our environment. So today, we'll all discover how we can become friends of the earth. And I'm so fortunate uh, to have met you, Vanessa, uh, during my tenure of undergraduate program uh, at UBC in Canada. We all uh, now see the world heading towards sustainability and um, people showing more care for the planet only when our earth is facing more difficult challenges in the recent mm -hmm. years. So, but you were a pioneer in realizing the importance of protecting the planet even 20 years ago. So to begin with our first question, Vanessa, what inspired you to begin a social enterprise that revolved around educating children about environmental responsibilities uh, through theater and then drama. And now uh, it has become a digital educational platform uh, mm. called Planet Protector Academy. 
Thank you. Um, when I was in my 20s, I lived in a very, very beautiful place in British Columbia called Tofino. That is, that it, if you know what Hawaii looks like uh, with mountains and ocean and just beauty everywhere, that is what it looked like. And my backyard of the beautiful house that I lived in was a rainforest. And one day the rainforest was just cut down suddenly in my backyard and the, the trees burned right outside my window. And as I watched this, I realized that this was ha happening all over the world. I had a very deep and impactful experience that is what made me become environmentally concerned. I joined the other young people who were trying to protect that same rainforest in a, in a larger area. Um, and we actually succeeded. It became a UN biosphere reserve, even though there were only about 12 of us who started, it became a Canada's biggest environmental movement within a couple of short years. But I was always a musical theater performer like you, Srisha, I'm a singer. And so there was, a, I had a call inside me after that to go back to musical theater, which felt very strange after doing something so serious to do something perhaps seemingly frivolous. But then my husband, who is a performer, who plays Goober in our shows, he and I started working for the city of Vancouver to make a play for children about the environment. And that was uh, 20 years ago now, but it became very popular. These plays were very, also very effective. And we saw, I had tried in between saving the rainforest and doing the plays to convince adults to change what they were doing. You must recycle. No one was recycling and no one cared. Adults did not care. Adults didn't want to change. But with these plays for children, we found the children would be so excited and understand so simply what it means to take care of the environment that they would run home and tell their parents and they would change their families. Over and over and over this happened. So this is when we did theater and we realized we could only do the theater locally in Vancouver. Well, we reached many children there. We wanted to expand where we could reach to and bring this fun and music and the theatricality as far as we could. And which is why we began to create the Planet Protector Academy. Because children have a lot of power to convince parents who don't necessarily want to listen in the first place to me. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. That's, that's amazing. And uh, I think you very well mentioned that, you know, um, as schools, even um, educators have the opportunity to um, bring instill that kind of environmental responsibility in the children. And children are like uh, blank slates. They, they take in all the information so um, uh, with so much of open mindedness and mm -hmm. When they go and teach their family, it's just um, the parents have no other choice but to, you know, uh, listen to them because they are trying to influence them with a positive uh, behavior. Mm. Towards the environment. And children understand simply, oh, my body is 70% water, so I shouldn't pollute water. It's very obvious to children that that makes sense. It's very easy, but for adults, it's more complicated because we have our old habits, we have our jobs that maybe depend on things that hurt the water. <laughs> it's much more complicated for adults, but for children, it's obvious. That's the water, I shouldn't pollute it, because I am water. <laughs> exactly, so that's, that's very nice. I think uh, uh, the thought of even doing that and uh, initiating it and successfully running it for the last uh, 20 years and I'm sure uh, it's going to uh, plan predictor academy is going to grow to heights uh, even after this so we're so happy as a Supreme family we're also uh, connected with uh, plan protector academy and seeing that impact happen through the children and their families so moving on to our next question mm -hmm. often um, parents teach their children about sharing and caring within the human race, uh, but could be for material, materialistic purposes like um, sharing toys, or it could even be for sharing uh, food. If we talk to our um, children about sharing the earth um, as a place to live in 
and um, its resources with every living being like animals um, mm -hmm. plants, and the people I believe the conversation becomes a no-brainer so could you tell us how you as a parent um, had environmental conversations with your daughter Tia uh, mm. sharing the passion you have for our planet and how she uh, in turn turned into a responsible uh, child towards the earth oh um, well it's one of those things in the old way of thinking we see things as separate like oh I can just take this piece of the earth and it doesn't matter but as, as science is showing us more and more, all the pieces are interconnected. So if we take this piece, this piece served part of the environment, and now that part is no longer served, and everything suffers. So this understanding of that interconnectedness, that we depend on each other, we are not separate, we're not humans walking on top of an earth that we can just take from. We are part of earth, we are animals, we all know this, our bodies are animal bodies. <laughs> we forget that. And they're part of nature. When we talk about nature, it's also this being here is part of nature. It's not a separate over there nature. And that's what we told Tia, our daughter, that we're all part of the planet and we are all dependent on each other and we all have to take care of each other. So it's a deep kindness. And not just it's not just sharing my toy with you. It's and, and we could think of sharing the planet as I get this mountain, you get that mountain. <laughs> and we can each dig it up. But if we're sharing with all beings, then we recognize that I am dependent on that mountain staying whole because it cleans the air. The trees on that mountain clean the air that I breathe. So we're interconnected. It's amazing. Yeah. And, um, and I'm sure right now she's also um, involving herself in... Planet Protector Academy and uh, many more things. So mm -hmm. as a parent, I think you've done a wonderful jo job communicating these um, uh, responsibilities to her. And Thank you. Uh, what do you think um, are the parents here in India especially should be doing with their kids? Oh my, I don't know if I should be saying, but... <laughs> uh, I think actually to listen to their children because we're in a time and I say this even for myself, even though I teach children about the environment, but we're in a time in the world when our old ways have to change and we, we don't necessarily know as adults the best way forward and often it is the next generation that is going to know and maybe they don't know yet. <laughs> I mean, you might be thinking, my daughter is five. What does she know? She knows nothing. <laughs> but she does know some things. She knows about love and she knows about life and she knows about caring. And these are the kind of things that we need to shift to. And I think that this, especially the youngest children now, that they have uh, some because they didn't grow up in the same world as us, they're growing up in this world, that they're the ones who are going to know the pathway forward and we need to listen to them. Not to eat more candy. That's not the pathway I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> for solutions for the world, yeah. Thank you for that. And um, we're often reminded uh, to leave a legacy behind. <clears throat> Uh, and make a difference in people's lives. So, but it has not ha been the same um, when it comes to positively impacting the planet. So how do we take this more seriously? Oh, about a legacy. Well, that's interesting because in some ways, it's a, a, a legacy of not doing, of not harm. Right, that instead of a, I have a legacy of, um, I'm not sure of what one what one have thought before, but now it's a legacy of a of a planet that is habitable for our children that we need to leave. So, it's what whatever we can do to make sure that our children have a planet that has fewer fires. Uh, right now in Vancouver, uh, the the sky is thick with smoke and the sun is orange because of the fires that are in the U.S. the Western U.S. states. 
south of us. Uh, and that is largely worsened by climate change. So I think the prime legacy that for us to leave is a, is a world we can live on together, our children and grandchildren. Yeah. And so how do the children um, also take this more seriously right now? Maybe this is an idea for mm. the parents. Um, but how can the children now take this idea more seriously at their, at their age? Yeah. At their age? Well, it's really, for children, it's really on the level of habits. As we, uh, as we all know, we're trying to get our children, young children especially, to have good habits. Uh, and then we remember how hard it was for us to get our own habits and why they're so hard to change, because it was so hard to get them there in the first place. And so children can learn to have habits that are more caring for the environment. For example, um, if children, if if we have a habit of shopping a lot to be, uh, make ourselves feel better, oh, I love shopping, or uh, we can find other ways that our children and we can find that same joy, but without using up resources. So helping children to have habits of care for the environment, turning off the taps, being aware that everything that we use is part of life. Every object that we use is part of the earth and to use it respectfully and with care. Those are great things for children to, to understand. Exactly. Yeah, so very well said. Uh, thank you for that, Vanessa. Um, I firmly believe that, you know, like you said, the millennials and the newer generations have realized the importance of sustainability and are working uh, to make this world a better place to live in. And typically, the decision makers of uh, today's world are not of these generations. And they are the ones who can catalyze the uh, transition to more uh, sustain sustainable practices in organizations or governments or mm -hmm. the economies. So you are an excellent exception uh, to this norm uh, because... You, you have a, you've been a pioneer uh, 20 years ago itself in taking this responsibility. So how would you suggest uh, the older generation uh, still contribute to creating a more sustainable future? Oh, absolutely. Of course, as you say, the older generation has a lot more power in, in society than the younger generation. And... Um, and we all have power. We might not think we have power necessarily, but we all have power to make some change and we can look in our lives. I can't prescribe what everyone should do, of course, because I don't know what your lives are and where you work or what your influence is, but we all in our various ways have power. And that's part of the message of the Planet Protector Academy. Sometimes we think, oh, I'm just one person. What can I do? I only, I can't change the whole world. But everyone has influence somewhere to make a change. And our idea is that we all need to make it. So it's not just reliant on one person to be able to know, I'm going to go to the government and have them stop this one thing. We can all write to the government. We can all advocate to the government, but we can't make it change me just by myself. But we can all together, each of us doing our part, finding the ways that we have influence the way, well, how are we doing what are, what are the things that we're buying and can we, be, can we buy less? Can we consider the environment and, what, and the, the ways that we spend our money? These are things that we each can do. And, and if we do them together and we help each other and speak to each other about this, the importance of this, this is what it's going to take, is all of us. Exactly. Thank you for that, Vanessa. And uh, I think, yeah, you very well mentioned, you know, the power is... The power could be um, in the older generation's hands, but uh, it is that individual responsibility that each of us can take um, and, you know, make that impact. Mm -hmm. So thank you for saying that. And there are two ways to look at sustainability. So one would be to adopt sustainable practices and create the change. And the other would be to incorporate uh, sustainability in designs of products and um, services. So, Vanessa, it would be 
very insightful if you could share how um, our students here could instill sustainability um, right from the beginning of any task because I think these students will be our future leaders and inventors and if they can do this uh, the end result will be more efficient. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it, of course, it, there are many ways that students will be in the world working or being. Uh, so I can't speak to all of them. But if we talk about if somebody becomes a product designer, like you say, and they think about how can this be part of a regenerative cycle. So right now we have a cycle of, of products where we take from the environment and then we use the product and then it goes in the garbage and it's never used again. And the, if it, nature is not like that. Nature, the gar one, one animal's garbage is another one's food. So there's always a cycle that life is in. And so for whatever we are doing, if we think, how can I bring this from a linear or a line-based uh, way of being into a cycle so that it regenerates, so that it's a concept that you can apply to whatever you're doing, how can this be regenerative? And even for the ways that we work, the ways that we overwork in our current society is very much this linear, you, you give out all your, your energy and then you collapse at the end of the day or the week. And, and personal regeneration is part of that, again, because we are part of life. So how can our personal lives be more sustainable so that and the two go together because if we're, oh, if we're chasing after owning as much as we can and showing our wealth by all the things that we own, then we're also exhausting ourselves. And there's this idea of enough. If, if there's a place of enoughness, which is, I don't know if that's a word, um, because we have one planet and we're using it at a rate of three, I think, or something. So we're using it up. We're going to run out. So we can't keep, life will tell us stop. Life is telling us stop, even if we don't ourselves. And, and we can shift to be in a cyclical, regenerative way of being. So that's what we hope for. So that's a, a principle to apply to whatever one is doing. So uh, if I'm not wrong, I think uh, we would call this a circular economy. Um, yes, correct. So, uh, you know, the products design, uh, focusing on uh, mm. circular economy. And I think... Um, I came across this article that mentioned um, about uh, the packaging, especially. Um, there's this cookies company, um, you know, creating the packaging out just so that, you know, uh, there are multiple benefits for making the packaging. Uh, we get attracted. We know what uh, is inside the packaging. Uh, the ultimate purpose is that we want to eat that cookie, right? So, um, but we mm -hmm. get the uh, product along with the package and once we finish eating the cookies, what happens to that package? We just uh, discard it off. And uh, especially in India, we we see a lot of uh, littering happening. Mm. That the public just uh, irresponsibly uh, throw the waste off. And so, because of that, I think you know the the that particular waste. The cook, if I would have thrown a package, a cookies uh, package, that that would have probably costed one cent uh, for the company. But then once it goes off, if it was blown off to the river, and mm -hmm. then um, if somebody were to, if the corporation, if the government was, um, were to clean that, um, it would cost them about 50 cents. And then if it goes to the ocean, um, cleaning it from there becomes a bigger task. So then it would cost around two pounds. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe if it was all thought of at the production stage, mm -hmm. design stage, um, you know, like you said, if this this is probably probably this model is linear because they wouldn't have thought of the end cycle, mm -hmm. um, end result. But then if it was cyclical, like you mentioned, they could have thought about um, you know collecting those packages back or mm -hmm. not using. Uh, the material they use in the packaging mm -hmm. they could be using something else or yeah. right so uh, it'd be great to hear more on uh, 
the three R's or whatever uh, uh, composes uh, sustainability. Sure. Actually, just on the, the packaging side, if you think often there's plastic in packaging, and we don't think about this, but when the plastic is made, often there's a river that's getting polluted in the making of the packaging. So if the packaging, some packaging is now being made out of materials that are biodegradable, but that also means that at the beginning, there's no river being polluted by the making of these packages. So it's, it's all the way through. We think of there are costs to everything that we do, and many of the environmental costs are not calculated. We just think this package is so many, this costs so much, this, this thing I'm buying, but the cost to the river and to the people who live on the river and the animals that live on, that, that feed off the river that we want to eat that are then polluted, that make us sick, you know, it's, it's all, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of selfish to do this properly. It seems like both ways are selfish in different ways, but um, it's not just a selfless thing to think about the environment. It also affects our own health and well-being that I don't know about you, but I don't want a lot of chemicals in my body from different, from different things, and I know they are there, unfortunately. Um, in terms of the many things that we can do, it's almost, <laughs> there, there's so many of them, but uh, not littering is a very good one. And then, of course, whether you can recycle packages depends on the systems in your city. Right? Some cities in India, I know, don't have recycling or a place to take and I know that SSVM has been a leader in helping the, the, uh, the cities uh, move towards this kind of program, which is wonderful. Um, but at the same time, we can be responsible with when we buy something, we can look at it and we can say, well, I've got two options here and one is covered in plastic and one is not. So I'm going to take the one that is not. There are these small choices. And one of my teachers said to me, because we don't often have a full choice. Well, the, this one is very expensive and I can't afford it. And this one is less expensive. I can afford it, but it's less good for the environment. You know, it's hard to make these choices. But my teacher said, when faced with a, a choice, neither of which is the best choice, to always choose the kindest choice or the least harmful. So you might not be choosing a non-harmful option but you're choosing the least harmful and gradually that's how we will shift ourselves it can feel overwhelming oh there's so much to be done but it's all about small steps one by one you don't have to become an environmental superhero in all ways today or even tomorrow but you can do one small thing today you can change one little habit this week or this month that's great i think uh, yeah having those small goals and trying to reach them, we, uh, you know, collectively reach a bigger goal. And um, that way, you know, we can definitely make that difference happen. So thank you very much for sharing that, uh, Vanessa. And Vanessa, how can we all um, make sustainable changes at home? You know, we've, we've talked about packaging and, you know, choosing mm -hmm. the less harmful option. But um, say, for example, let's, let's talk about more uh, specific examples um, at home. Um, so it could be using a soap or uh, uh, choosing a more sustainable soap option or could be uh, tran transitioning from um, a plastic brush to a wooden brush or, um, you know, even choosing the right uh, package goods. Um, this period definitely would uh, be a great opportunity to change our habits um, mm. and you know, starting off with us. Like, if you, like you say, uh, we just take the soap, for example, that to buy a soap that is biodegradable and doesn't pollute when you use it is wonderful. But it's not just, again, wonderful for the environment. It has no chemicals that will hurt your body or your children's body. And we've learned more and more from science that the soaps that we use and the chemicals in them end up in our bloodstream. You know, this, there's such rise of cancers and other health problems that we have that are related to this pollution in our bodies. So, um, oh my goodness, there's, there's, there are many things that we can do at home aside from purchasing, but even in terms of the foods that we buy, and I know it's, it's different in any, than in, in Canada, everything is packaged like 
one apple might have a plastic wrap on it. It's ridiculous. I'm not, not always, but just sometimes you see the packaging and it's like, and it's a bit different in India, but buying things that are in bulk. So, you know, if um, it would, I think uh, lots of Indian families already do this, they buy a big giant bag of rice, right? So that as opposed to like 72 little bags of rice. Um, and I'm thinking, what are, what are some other things? Um, the water that we use. And now again, I know there's less wastage of water generally by people in India than there is in Canada. There's a lot of people just run the taps and walk away and let the tap run and all this water is being wasted. Um, but we can care for our water in the same way by making sure that we're only using what we need and turning off the taps and, and not pouring um, chemicals into the water system down our drain, but taking them, I don't... Again, I don't know the systems in India, but if there's a place to take uh, chemicals that you might pour down the drain, like paint or, or paint thinner or other harsh, harsh things like this, that you can dispose of, learn to dispose of them properly instead of adding them to the water system because then it kills fish and it comes back to us for those fish we eat and, and then the water we drink, right? So, No, it's, it's very true what you mentioned because uh, uh, we see a lot of, uh, you know, untreated sewage systems here. Um, mm. And um, I think even during your visit, you would have uh, seen how uh, the Indian roads have, uh, uh, you know, drainage along with it. Uh, a yeah. lot of them are open. And um, maybe because of the lack of exposure, uh, people are, you know, discarding the garbage even uh, right on the uh, water. And all mm. these go and clog into the river. And Absolutely. Ultimately, ultimately, join the ocean. So yeah, it all begins individually, right at our home, and maybe even not just home. Um, we have to, even when we are, um, you know, uh, in public places. I think we have to be really uh, responsible mm -hmm. and always having that thought in our mind. Right. Mm -hmm. So. And we uh, can all be leaders in this because when we take care, it inspires other people to take care as well. So, and, and we don't just have to harass them. <laughs> That's not the, necessarily the best way of doing it. But, um, but yeah, we, we, we can encourage our neighbors also to, to, you can say, oh, look, I found a way to dispose of this, this chemical, or I found a place to take my cardboard that isn't just in the street or whatever. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, communicating uh, productively uh, using all these uh, discussions, I think that would be a great thing to do <laughs> in the society as well. So mm -hmm. uh, that's amazing. And so parents and um, educators at every level do not only have um, an incredible opportunity, uh, but they also have a moral responsibility uh, to make an environmental ethic part of mm -hmm. uh, the collective culture. Mm -hmm. So what can parents do to ensure this? So to ensure that the educators? Uh, that they have a moral responsibility towards making, the, making an environmental ethic uh, part of our collective culture. So what can parents do to help the education system shift? Is that your question? Uh, maybe not really the education system. Okay. Shift, but um, in their families, um, how can they... Um, change the mindset and um, inculcate that uh, you know responsibility because a lot of times I think even children um, are we all actually I think we would have learned from uh, our environment and we are who we are because of what we see and what we learn from our surroundings so uh, it is really really important for uh, the parents at uh, any point to have that kind of uh, environmental ethic um, uh, part of our uh, culture. So how, how do you think they can ensure this? I think if one has an inner commitment, you don't need to know the whole pathway. And I think that is probably, because otherwise you might feel like, oh, I need to know more than I know. I need to, in order to, I, I, somebody listening to, to, tonight might think, oh, this is a very good idea, but I don't really know how to do it. <laughs> Which is actually, it's okay, because I, 20 years ago, I had no idea either. Um, there's also 
great deal of information on the internet, so that's very handy. But the having the attitude of care and of thinking about the environment is perhaps the most important thing, that just the attitude shift. So we generally are very disconnected from the land and the water. For example, we are we walk about as if it didn't matter or it didn't exist almost. And um, whereas ancient peoples who lived on the land or tribal peoples were very intimately connected with the land and as civilization has advanced, we've become disconnected. And so one of the pieces that we can do is to begin to be connected to the land. If anyone um, has a spiritual practice, for example, and has ever done this practice by the ocean or a river that, or under a tree, you know that there is a different quality there. And that quality is that connection that one finds in that silence with the land. So there's that piece of a, it's, it's like a, a way of being shift. And when you are feeling more connected to the land, then you can just start to see on your own things that you can do to change the land, to change how you treat the land. So for example, if you feel more connected to the earth, which we depend on for our air and our water and our whole being, then you can start to see, oh, I was going to throw this out, but I just realized this is going to have a negative impact. Um, so how to ensure that it happens is really about uh, repetition, which is why we, in our programs we give children points. So in a family if you wished to help your family to become more environmentally responsible, you could have a system of points. I think probably Indian children like charts with stars as much as Canadian children, small children anyway, when they get older, they get they start to say, what is that? That's a sticker. <laughs> but for young children, especially who are learning habits. So we can have a chart for the whole family and we can have a reward at the end if we, you know, if everyone in the family does a certain thing, like turning off the taps, or if you have recycling to put things in recycling, or whatever it is, the habit that you're hoping to help your family to develop now, you can have a system of points and a reward to help bring that habit. We all know habits take time. I think it's 28 days to do something before it's a habit. And, uh, and so helping with this way of encouraging each other with points is very helpful. So yeah, um, I think uh, the idea that you mentioned is uh, great. And we've seen that change happen uh, even in Planet Protector Academy program and we've had those incentives um, and that, that gamified uh, learning and the point system, I think, the children are just um, having that, um, uh, you know, motivation and excitement to actually do um, uh, that thing for their planet and change the behavior in their family as well. So here, I think at homes, the parents, depending on the um, age of the children, um, they can definitely come out with different ways to incentivize and, mm -hmm. you know, reward uh, their children. And it does still work with teenagers in terms of the, the, the reward has to be something they actually want, though. Small children can be just excited about stickers, but... Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very true, very true. Uh, adults as well can, rewards can help. Yeah, very much. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Vanessa. And um, I've lived in Vancouver and I've definitely witnessed this. So Vancouver is a zero waste city and that was achieved only with the help of the public uh, the students and the educators such as you so Coimbatore I believe has the same uh, potential to become a zero waste city in India um, and as an individual and um, uh, students also uh, being residents living here how do you uh, propose that we can individually and collectively achieve a zero waste uh, crime or city like uh, Vancouver? Oh, that's an interesting question. I mean, it, as you say, it was, it was many people for, we were part of it because we did our plays for the city of Vancouver 
um, our program was uh, part of that uh, development. So we did these fun plays for children uh, for 20 years. And for, it was for 10 years before the city had the, uh, the greenest city goals that were made. And we said, um, when, the, when the city said, we are going to be the greenest city in the world, the public said, okay. <laughs> and they voted back in that, that political party repeatedly because of those, uh, in part because of those goals. But we had had all the children in the city going home talking to their parents for 10 years before that. So that was, we feel uh, proud of our, we don't know, of course, directly, but we feel that we were part of the wave that made that happen. So again, it's about acting together. It's not just an individual thing. So I would say that how to look at how can we act together? How can we collectively convince the city to make a change this way? How can I be willing to be a part of that solution. And I know SSVM is already on this pathway, so I'm not telling you something you don't know, Srisha. <laughs> um, started, but um, yeah, we've, we've started teaching the households uh, through the children and mm -hmm. the children are doing an amazing job with that. And I think, um, like you said, it definitely makes um, uh, an, a difference when a lot, uh, the collective, uh, system all of the people uh, you know support uh, such a belief and mm -hmm. um, uh, thought and that they have to actually ensure that the city is clean and green and uh, that is something that is really challenging definitely in India but um, I think yeah w without losing our hopes I think we can definitely you know make this uh, work especially with the children, because they have a greater advantage, um, you, you know, when they teach the adults, uh, the adults just uh, take them with mm. um, open heartedness. So, yeah, I think um, w we should collectively make this uh, change happen. In mm -hmm. uh, thank you for sharing that. And if there is a message that uh, you could share uh, to our children um, to constantly keep our planet Earth in their minds uh, when they are involved in any kind of action. Um, that would be great. Mm. I think it's that, that we are part of Earth, that we are to remember we're part of Earth and that the Earth, we are caretakers of Earth and part of Earth. And we need to, especially for the children, because this generation, I tell you, I have such great hopes for around the planet. And I think this generation of children can think, we are the ones who are going to make the change. And maybe I don't know yet how, because I'm six. That's okay. You don't have to know how. You can just have the commitment in your heart that you're going to be part of it. You're going to be a planet protector for life. We're all planet protectors for life. And I think, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely, we'll definitely have that uh, message uh, in our minds and um, constantly, you know, think about it every day. Uh, every day we wake up, uh, we have to always think about our Earth and um, our planet and keep our uh, future generations um, happy and fine as well. And I think we'll all be working together for that. So thank you. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, You're very welcome. It has been a wonderful session and it's really a pleasure to um, host you uh, in the session today. And you are, you are just very enlightening um, and, you know, um, by teaching us how we can make our planet more beautiful and sustainable and how we can build that uh, care for our Earth. So, and you've shown that by... Um, your examples and you've uh, and your stories as well. So thank you very much for that, Vanessa. Thank you. Well, SSVM has been a great leader in India for our work, and we are very, very grateful to you for bringing our work, you, Srisha specifically, for bringing what the Planet Protectors to SSVM uh, because it's been a pure delight. And that's one thing I was thinking is that for the children to know that they're 
at the center of caring for the earth is great joy. It doesn't have to be just about doing chores differently, <laughs> but there's a great joy in being connected to the planet and taking care of it. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank and you. thank you everyone for, for being here with us today, tonight.